what is it that a country like India can do in terms of its energy policies uh, in a climate constrained world which do not really uh, necessarily, uh, which are not necessarily uh, against our development goals or so called development needs. I think some of this stuff has already been talked about uh, perhaps in uh, presentations yesterday and today definitely. Uh, colleagues uh, Radhika Shrihari had presented a paper in one of the panel sessions which also is on the same lines but to very quickly run through essentially any policy formulation in India, energy policy formulation in India anyway has to deal with multiple challenges. It is not that uh, energy policies or most developmental policies can be framed with a single objective in mind. In the case of energy policy, for example, we already have multiple challenges such as poor access and consumption of modern energy. There is a high inequity as some people have already pointed out. We have a very weak infrastructure for electricity in the country, whether it is regarding electricity or for the gas networks, the railway networks, whatever it is. We have, we are not very rich in resources, whether it is hydrocarbons in terms of conventional energy resources or associated resources such as land, water, all of which are also required if you want to actually have sufficient energy in the country. Uh, and we also have had a serious problem with our environmental management in terms of our own local air and water issues and how we deal with them in relation to energy. So it is not that we haven't had enough problems to deal with in terms of our energy policy formulation. I submit that climate change is essentially just extended this list. Except that the key difference with climate change is that it is not a problem if unaddressed only affects a few people in some villages or in some tribes somewhere, it is probably a problem that is going to affect all of us all over the world. That is probably what makes climate change a different uh, thing to look at. But otherwise, it does not change the fundamental fact that Indian energy policy formulation does need to deal with multiple challenges simultaneously. And the terminology for this are also well known, uh, co-benefits or co-impacts uh, approaches and explicit recognition and trade-offs of these various challenges that exist. But the good news is that uh, there are options that actually can influence all these things in a reasonably positive direction, if not for everybody, at least for the people for whom it matters most. And what I will try to do in the next seven or eight minutes of my presentation is to try to present a few such options. So the first one is uh, very broadly, actually what I want to present is four baskets of uh, or areas of options. The first basket is energy efficiency. Uh, efficiency itself can be uh, in various directions. So one could talk about efficiency within our buildings, how we construct our buildings. It could be in terms of the appliances we use within our buildings. It could be in terms of industrial processes. It could be in terms of the agricultural practices and agricultural equipment we use. It could be vehicles that we drive on the roads or that are being driven on the roads. And the approaches that we have could be multiple too. So typically efficiency strategies, you could have standard essentially mandates that you must follow certain efficiency standards in terms of per unit energy, uh, energy consumption per unit of output. There could be incentives offered to you for following energy efficient paths or there could be penalties imposed on following inefficient paths. There could be awareness building operations, there could be market creation kind of uh, policies, instruments. I don't want to go into the details of the various instruments but this is just to give you the possible landscape. And the reason why we believe that this is important and uh, as I said earlier why this helps address the multiple challenges we are talking about is because most calculations and a particular analysis done by Prayas a few years ago showed that the cost of saved electricity from improved efficiency in appliances is just about 2.5 rupees per kilowatt hour which is probably about half the cost of electricity generated from domestic coal today. So if you look at saved energy from energy efficiency as a source of energy it's actually a much cheaper source of energy than any other source of energy you can think of. This of course has multiple knock-on effects. It makes it easier to improve the energy access and consumption problems that we talked about earlier. It is much less resource intensive. You need to mine less coal or use less land or use less water. And of course it also typically would result in fewer GHG emissions. And to back all this up, I just want to flash one graph before you which is uh, based out of the India Energy Security Scenarios uh, tool which the Niti Aayog has built up. I don't think we should focus too much on the numbers here. I think the important message that I want to just give is that if you, whether you take uh, the building sector or the appliances sector or the industrial sector, in all these three, if you pursue what 
the ESS defines as heroic efficiency pursuit. Essentially, go full on after efficiency maximization in these sectors. You save money, you save energy, and you save efficiency. So, essentially, there's no reason for a country like India also to say that we don't want to do efficiency. You're saving money, you're saving energy consumption, and as a result, you're saving emission reductions. So, what else can you really ask for? And obviously, this can lead to various positive outcomes that we are talking about uh, earlier. Similarly, another broad sector that I want to touch upon is transport, which is roughly, I think, about 10% of India's GAG emissions today. Multiple options are again available. It's not that there are no options in the transport sector. So, if you want to talk about freight, today, increasingly, more and more of our freight travels by road rather than by rail, um, because our rail system is so horribly inefficient. So, if we could actually have the right kind of uh, railway system in our country, and so that people want to shift their freight by rail rather than road, that will rail is about 10 or 11 times more efficient, energy efficient than shifting shipping something by road. Per ton kilometer is about 10 to 11 times more efficient. Similarly, within the urban setting, using public and non-motorized transport, or in greater use of these modes rather than private motorized transport. Inter-urban or inter-city passenger travel, greater use of rail as compared to either road or air. The two alternatives which are actually growing faster than rail are actually road and air, both of which are much more inefficient than rail and we seem to be ignoring that aspect. And of course, better spatial planning itself in terms of making sure that the distance to be travelled itself reduces as far as possible through intelligent uh, planning that minimizes the need to travel in the first place. And these once again will have multiple so-called co-benefits. They not only reduce GHG emissions, but they reduce costs because again, you're saving energy, so costs are going to go down, which means that once again, your access is going to improve and uh, therefore mobility access improves means there are going to be more people with better access to education and jobs. Uh, it's going to reduce our imports because we import about 80% of our oil and one of the biggest consumers of oil in the country is of course the transport sector. So the less energy you spend on transport and the more you shift transport away from electricity to other more, sorry, from oil to other modes such as electricity, the less you need to depend on oil, which means you're going to reduce our imports. And the latest uh, kind of uh, hot topic in the country seems to be over air quality because suddenly people have woken up to the fact that Delhi's air is bad. We all knew it was always bad for the last 10 years or probably more, but suddenly it's a topic of international discussion, therefore a topic of policy focus. That will also improve because significant part of uh, air quality in cities at least is transport emissions. And once again, IESS data to back this up saying that if I, uh, you should all, this is all uh, from a draft version of IESS that's yet to be launched, but we hope that the sec this version from which I've taken this data will get launched this sometime in this month or so. Uh, after which you can kind of very play around with the tool yourself and try to get to see uh, for yourself how these numbers play out. But this graphs here are essentially saying that if I go very aggressively on demand reduction through whatever means I can in terms of reducing travel demand, that is again going to save me energy, it's going to save me cost, it's going to save me emissions. That's the left set of bars, the right set of bars says if I aggressively go after modal shift, which is essentially moving from private vehicles to public vehicles or from road to rail in terms of either freight or interurban movement or from air to rail for that matter. And once again, going to be saving on all three fronts. So again, a very clear example, if not for the precise numbers, again, I don't want to focus on the precise numbers that IES is throwing up, but the fact that the broad direction is that one is going to be better off in terms of emissions, in terms of money and in terms of energy consumption and therefore in terms of local air pollution and so on and so forth. The last two baskets that I want to focus on are renewable energy and cooking which I will come to in a minute or two. Renewable energy of course is a standard uh, tool that is everybody, uh, we all believe is an important tool to combat climate change. But for India it is also important from other reasons. It is also, as I said earlier, we are uh, poor in local fossil fuel resources. Uh, so, it's important to us from that point of view. It's also important to local environmental pollution because most of these things don't lead to local pollution. And in the long term, of course, we all uh, expect that renewable energy is going to be much more cost effective than fossil fuels. And the government has announced aggressive plans for renewable energy, but what I want to suggest is a few policy ideas that will make 
this uh, ambitious announcement by the government aligned to this goals that we are talking about in terms of development and equity and uh, greater access and so on. So three or four such ideas to be presented. One is uh, an idea that actually already I am glad to say being taken up by many states including Maharashtra which is the idea of enabling net metering for installing rooftop photovoltaic systems. So most people, many people don't want to do that because if it is producing electricity when I don't want it, what do I do with it? Do I store it in my battery in an inverter or do I lose it? What if that is not producing electricity when I need it? Do I get it from the grid? So the simple solution of course is to enable me to plug my rooftop system into the grid so that when it is producing more than what I want, it can feed the grid. When I, it is producing less than what I want, I can take from the grid. That's a kind of a regulation that's now coming through in many cities, and in many states. Uh, and what this will essentially enable is the high-end consumers will be incentivized to set up such systems and therefore uh, the high-end consumers essentially pay for high-cost resource and thus uh, increase the equity within the country. And secondly, since this is a system that doesn't need batteries, essentially it's also more environmentally friendly, apart from the, for the solar angle itself. The second is that price is a big constraint today with renewable energy, but uh, some of you might have noticed that I think a week or two ago, Madhya Pradesh conducted a reverse bidding auction for solar procurement where they got bids for 5 rupees. So now you are already talking of solar which is people are willing to sell you for 5 rupees a kilowatt hour, which is an excellent price. Uh, and similar approaches unfortunately have not started taking off for wind. So what we believe that going for a reverse auction based procurement or wind based power is another way of driving down renewable energy prices which will again increase the uptake of renewable energy and also reduce the resistance of distribution companies to buy it. A new idea that I just want to quickly propose is uh, for this part of the, as part of the 175 gigawatts of solar that the country wants to install, we believe a good way of doing it will be to install what we call a stale end grid connected one or two megawatt solar power plants which are essentially intended to serve agricultural loads. This is particularly true where you have already had feeder separation that has happened, where you have agricultural feeders which have been separated from residential feeders. So on the agricultural feeders one can set up these small solar power plants which are close to the consumption centers which will ensure that the farmers are going to actually get power not at 2 o'clock in the night when nobody else needs power but when the sun is shining which is during the daytime and they can actually do their farming activity. It will be a, it will lead to fewer pump burnouts because there will be a quality supply. And in the longer term, it might also build trust between the utility and the farmer, which means the farmer's willingness to pay for electricity might also increase. Today, one of the big reasons for farmers not willing to pay is the distrust between the utility and the farmer. This is also far more cost effective than uh, individual solar farms, which is the way that is being currently promoted. We believe that something like this will be about 50% more cost effective. It's a much more effective use of the RPO, the renewable purchase obligations, and it will also be something that the utility should like because essentially this is a more like a localized system between the farmer and the solar plant with the utility just getting the benefit of the RPO in some sense. And of course as pump efficiencies improve and solar prices fall, this, this scheme will only get more and more attractive. Um, and of course one point I just wanted to flag is that even for renewable energy it is not that there are no socio-environmental impacts. There are issues that need to be dealt with and as we plan to rapidly ramp up renewable energy, I think these are the issues that one needs to consider upfront rather than with the conventional energy as we usually do post facto and then uh, run into trouble, it's much better to factor these things up front so that uh, issues can be handled in a more equitable manner. The last is a topic that I think multiple presentations in this conference have already talked about, so I don't want to spend much time on it. But uh, I, what I want to say is that cooking need not necessarily provision of modern cooking fuels to households. Uh, this is a, not a hypothesis that has been completely tested. But nonetheless, I believe that there is truth to it, which is that provision of modern cooking fuels to households need not necessarily only result in increasing greenhouse gas emissions. It, there is a possibility that it could, but there is also a possibility that it could reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And the reason for that, I don't think the points on this uh, slide are all talked about already, but uh, while there may be an increase in GHG emissions, because naturally there is going to be greater consumption of LPG and electricity, there are two reasons why I believe it could reduce GHG emissions also. One is of course the black carbon emissions which are essentially due to incomplete, in, incomplete combustion of biomass that is currently taking place which could lead to reduced uh, GHG emissions. And the second possibility is that uh, in future depending on how technology develops, 
available, available uh, residual biomass that is not used for cooking and burnt inefficiently could actually be used either for biomass based power generation or for biomass based liquid fuel generation, either of which can substitute fossil fuel based uh, generation of electricity or liquid fuels and therefore lead to redu reduction in GHG emissions. Similarly, for import dependence, import dependence will increase due to increased usage of LPG, but it could also decrease use to, due to reduced usage of liquid fuels and perhaps because uh, if one wants to go the biogas route, if one wants to use cow dung and produce biogas, the sludge is actually something that can be used as fertilizers and that could actually reduce fertilizer related emissions. So there are multiple routes and I think one needs to look at this issue more comprehensively to understand uh, overall impact of what it's going to do to GHG emissions and uh, my belief is that it really could be even have a positive impact on this. And here are a couple of numbers that uh, from IESS and P, uh, our own analysis which is presented in an earlier paper. Uh, IESS which does not consider black carbon actually thinks it will increase a little bit, the PEG analysis thinks it will decrease a little bit. Uh, that's my last slide. Uh, I just want to focus on the last point there that in spite of all this I think there are policy options but the two elements in the room that need to be addressed really without which no policy option is going to succeed is the distribution utilities that we have in our country and unless the problem of distribution utilities are solved no amount of other policies are going to address any of your problems and finally institutions and governance and their effective function. Thanks.